Okay, so thank you for everyone for coming to uh, this program on the uh, um, history of nuclear production in St. Louis. Um, it should be a very uh, interesting program, but um, so the speaker was brought in by Harvey Bergman. Um, she is excellent, but I'm going to uh, actually let Harvey do the introduction. So um, Harvey, with that, I'll hand it off to you. Well, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. All right. Yeah, it's been my pleasure to be working with uh, with Wendy. Oh, I guess I've been working on it for about 12 years, Wendy, for much longer than that, on all of the history of the nuclear waste in St. Louis uh, metropolitan area. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be introducing uh, Wendy today. Wendy completed her PhD in history at Washington University. Her work has been recognized with the Eisenhower Roberts Fellowship awarded by the Eisenhower Institute to support research into the Cold War, a Haas Fellowship promoting understanding of the chemical industry in relation to societal, environmental health and safety issues and in public understanding of science. She completed a residency at the Science History Institute in Pennsylvania and the Carlson, and she's received the Carlson Rachel Carson Prize for Best Dissertation in Environmental History awarded by the American Society for Environmental History. She has a lifelong interest in education, advocacy, and preserving the environment for future generations. Her research focuses on the nuclear history of the United States, especially the implications of nuclear weapons production on human health and the environment. And I, I also wanna mention that many of you have probably heard that uh, recently Senator Josh Hawley was able to add an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act to include the St. Louis metropolitan area, uh, along with other areas uh, affected by the Manhattan Project. Uh, we may have some time to talk about that at the end if people are interested. And with that, I turn the prog program over to Wendy. Thanks, Harvey. Thanks very much. I appreciate your introduction, and I'm very honored to be here today. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. I did bring some pictures to show you, so I hope that you find those interesting. All right. Can you all see that okay? Wonderful. Well, very recently, the role of our region, our metropolitan area and our state in US nuclear production has come into public view as never before. So most recently this very summer, the Associated Press publicly released a trove of material related to St. Louis's role at mid-century. And so those stories are available uh, widely um, at the Associated Press, uh, Muckrock and some other sites, you can find them online. Um, as Harvey mentioned, there is a legislative development um, that's very significant. And we also have radio and TV coverage in increasing amounts and three feature length films that cover this topic that might be of interest to you all. Um, in late 2017, HBO released Atomic Homefront. And then a couple of years prior to that, in 2015, in the fall, local filmmakers produced a documentary called The First Secret City. And this was produced by a journalist um, who was very involved with coverage of the story um, through the 1980s. And then just prior to that in the summer, another wonderful local St. Louis filmmaker produced The Safe Side of the Fence, um, which documents um, quite thoroughly the experience both of the sites and our nuclear workers. Um, all of these films look at our communities, um, the people who've been affected by production and the people who think about it and advocate in various directions um, for remedies in the aftermath. And so taken together, all of these documents and narratives and films, they raise important questions that we can think about. How did so many places in St. Louis become contaminated with radioactivity? And what does that even mean? And did we make atomic bombs in St. Louis? And if not, what exactly did we do here? And how did that get started? So these are some of the questions that We'll consider this morning here as we proceed. So part of our story takes us back to 1942 
when Dr. Arthur Holly Compton invited Edward Mallinckrodt Jr. to bring his Mallinckrodt chemical works into the Manhattan Project. This project and later post-war efforts to develop nuclear weapons needed basic raw materials to proceed. So the release of very large quantities of energy begins with the manipulation of the infinitely small. And that goes to the nature of what a nuclear chain reaction is. So a nuclear chain reaction occurs when neutrons, which are particles without charge, smash into atoms and break them into pieces, freeing other neutrons to do the same. And achieving this chain reaction, whether it's in a controlled fashion for a perceived public good or explosively in a weapon, depends on heavy industry. And St. Louis was thoroughly a part of that through mid-century. Experiments in physics up to 1941 suggested that there were two types of atomic bomb that might be possible. The first was based on a chain reaction in uranium, and the second based on a chain reaction in plutonium. So no one had ever really used uranium in large quantities prior to this. Prior to World War II, its most important use, uranium was as a coloring agent for pottery, and plutonium was only discovered in 1941. To complicate matters further, uranium exists in the form of different isotopes. So isotopes are atoms that have the same number of protons in the nucleus, making them chemically the same, but a different number of neutrons. In uranium, this affects susceptibility to fission or splitting. So initially two isotopes of uranium interested planners the most. These variants are typically referred to by their atomic weights, which means the, the number of protons and the number of neutrons combined. So U-235 and U-238 were of deep interest. U-235 was deemed to be best suited for a nuclear bomb, but it occurred in nature as only 0.7% of natural uranium in the environment. When atoms of U-238 are bombarded by neutrons and absorbs one, physicists found, they undergo a series of internal transformations and actually turn into plutonium. So that's why U-238 was of deep interest. A whole new kind of industry had to be created for the bomb effort. First, to separate virtually identical types of uranium, they were indistinguishable to the eye, indistinguishable to chemical processes. Next, the bomb project had to determine if a nuclear reaction could be caused and then controlled, and then finally, it had to determine whether plutonium in reactors could be made and could it be made on a mass scale. So a number of questions, big overarching questions that were swirling around the heads of planners. In April of 1942, Edward Mallinckrodt accepted Compton's invitation in roughly two hours after they talked. Mallinckrodt workers began the work of devising a chemical process to separate uranium from all of the impurities alongside of it in ore. Without chemically pure uranium, even finer isotopic separation would be hopeless. You have to have a pure sample to start with if you're going to parse isotopes of an element. So workers began processing by building the equipment in-house. Things had to be designed from scratch, and then they processed uranium 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So within 90 days, the Mallinckrodt Chemical Works delivered 60 tons of pure uranium the day before the official contract was signed. And then after that summer, roughly 30 tons of uranium a month, that translates into one ton a day after July, 1942. So after the war's end, Mallinckrodt expanded its production throughout the 1950s and at its downtown facility on Destrehan Street. Achieving chemical purity meant transformation into various salt forms of the element uranium. So you can see some examples of that here. So Mallinckrodt churned and baked salts alongside various extractive chemicals. And as they would do that, the uranium salts themselves changed color until you reach that green salt there on the bottom right and mixing green salt and a few other ingredients, including magnesium in a vessel that looked very much like this. They called this a bomb because it was heated to very high heat under intense pressure would yield at the end of that a metal dingot. Now these metals could be processed and then machined into various shapes, including uh, fuel rods for reactors. So these are our uranium processing workers undertaking these tasks. So in the late 1950s, Mallinckrodt expanded and moved production to the most advanced uranium purification facility ever built 
at Weldon Spring, Missouri, and it completed its work as a federal uranium contractor in 1966-67. So as a result, St. Louis has experienced many damaging nuclear legacies. Now, how we come to these legacies um, involves understanding the pressures that drove production in the first place. And to answer where those pressures came from, we have to come back to one of the major aims, again, of the initial bomb program, which was isotopic separation. And so Mallinckrodt's output is paving the way for other major breakthroughs across the production complex. So a major center of isotopic research and production was constructed in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and you can see Oak Ridge here on a map. This is a whole city that was dedicated to the purpose of atomic research, isotopic research, and various other facets of nuclear production. So several methods were pursued at once to achieve isotopic separation. Among the largest quantities of material obtained came from a process called gaseous diffusion. So essentially what that means is that atoms of a lighter isotope like 235 will pass more readily through a porous barrier than the heavier isotope. 238. And so designers planned a series of cascades, cascades of tanks, and the tanks were very large. And from these tanks emerged twin streams, one of U-235, one of U-238, moving in opposite directions. And you can see here a, a bit of the, the scope and the size of what we're talking about. If you look at this uh, gentleman's hand, and you can see the tank there in the background. And this is what the tanks look like when they were situated in series. And what we had here was a large number of series. The building that was built to house these tanks was called K-25. And this is a view from outside of K-25. It contained over 1.6 million cubic feet of floor space. It was four stories tall, and it was the world's largest building under one roof at the time that it was finished. And here you can see it from above, the U-shaped building there. Um, in the distance slightly on the left is K-25. Now, an important thing to remember is after the war, K-25 continued to function and actually gaseous diffusion efforts broadly nationally expanded at the same time. So K-25 was joined by four other plants like it, K-27, K-29, K-31 and K-33 in Oak Ridge. And then the facilities at Oak Ridge were actually duplicated in two other cities. So this became an enormous complex. So these facilities um, were joined by facilities in Paducah, Kentucky and Portsmouth, Ohio. So this map shows you Paducah in relation to Oak Ridge. Paducah witnessed four gaseous diffusion plants labeled with a C. 31, 33, 35, and 37. And Portsmouth had three other gaseous diffusion plants. And these at Portsmouth came online during the Eisenhower administration. So this is one facet of development that Mallinckrodt's work is directly supporting. Now its work also contributed to a second major question that the bomb project posed. Can a nuclear chain reaction be achieved? And if sustained, can it be harnessed to make plutonium? So coming full circle back to that question, the first nuclear reaction in world history was achieved and sustained in December, December 2nd, 1942, beneath the stands of the University of Chicago's Stagg Field. And all of the uranium in this event, all of it, came from Mallinckrodt Chemical Works in St. Louis, and Mallinckrodt was the sole supplier until 1943 for the government effort. Now, planners, built on that initial experiment with chain reaction and scaled it up almost immediately um, in Oak Ridge. And they built a reactor called X-10, again, to demonstrate the reactor concept and pioneer this grand experiment of trying to separate plutonium from the reactor fuel once it had been, once it had been burned in the reactor. So the success of the pilot plant at Oak Ridge, which you're seeing here of X-10, led to the creation of a reactor production complex, and that was situated in Hanford, Washington. So three production reactors came online in Hanford by 1945. And here you can see the reactor production complex, part of that complex. And a whole nother city took shape in Hanford, first to house many thousands of construction workers, and then to house uh, the operators who came to Hanford to operate this machinery and run the reactors. After the war, between 1943, 1947 and 1953, Hanford 
um, witnessed the completion of five additional reactors that joined the initial three. And then the government duplicated the idea of a production reactor complex at Savannah River. The Savannah River reactors were designed on a different model, uh, but nonetheless, a number of reactors were built there so that by 1988, between 1944 and 1988, the United States produced about 100 metric tons of plutonium through production reactors and built about 14 in total. So World War II witnessed the construction of facilities for plutonium extraction, for isotopic separation, and then the final prong that remained was weapons design. So the first facility that was dedicated to this purpose was Los Alamos, New Mexico. So again, without that chemically pure uranium to start with, designing a weapon that came from these later products down the production complex, um, these would not have been possible. So the production, the design production of weapons was put under uh, the stewardship of J. Robert Oppenheimer and Los Alamos opened in 1942. So here you can see J. Robert Oppenheimer and Leslie Groves who was directing the Manhattan Project. The site that was chosen for Los Alamos was chosen, Oppenheimer was familiar with it. It had a bit of separation from population centers and it was defined by these finger-like mazes of ground that you can see here in this image and it was uh, ideal for separating different pieces of the design uh, project from one another and insulating it from view. So there was tight security. This is one of the security checkpoints that became rather famous in art and photography later. And this is a picture of the Los Alamos tech area. Now, after World War II, other weapons design facilities were created to join Los Alamos, but this facility was extremely effective in doing its job during World War II. And as a result, by July of 1945, the physicists who had gathered there had produced a deliverable atomic weapon. And this was the first Trinity test of that weapon, July 16th, 1945. And here you can see that explosion in color. Within a short period of time, these weapons were deployed at Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945. So this is the aftermath of the Hiroshima detonation. And this is the aftermath of the Nagasaki detonation. Uh, Nagasaki weapon uh, generated about 21 kilotons of explosive force. And as a result of those bombings, um, the Japanese surrendered. And then by September, there was a formal treaty signed with Japan that stopped the war in the Pacific. And so where we're situated today, we're right in the middle of these two very important anniversaries as we are in the present on August the 8th. So to the very early 1950s, nuclear weapons of the type used at Hiroshima and Nagasaki depended on fission, the splitting of atoms, either of uranium or of plutonium. So what physicists devised were the basic designs that would make these weapons have the capacity that they ended up displaying. So this was the uranium-based weapon and it operates by rapidly joining two cores of uranium-235. When they join rapidly, moving the one fragment toward the other uh, near the nose of the weapon, you achieve a critical mass and the weapon detonates. And then this is the plutonium weapon, which functioned on a different concept. So this was an implosion weapon using plutonium. So if you go to see the Oppenheimer movie, um, they recreate various scenes from Los Alamos and this, uh, uh, rig up of the weapon, which shows you the jacket of explosives that surrounds the plutonium sphere at the center. And the plutonium weapon works on an implosion concept, meaning that explosive force is applied 360 degrees in every direction uniformly that creates a critical mass at the center uh, using the plutonium core, and then the weapon detonates. And so the Trinity weapon was a plutonium weapon. So looking at um, these images, the final one shows us the characteristic explosion that results um, from the technology. So you have super high heated air that rises high in the atmosphere and churns, giving us the mushroom effect. The destructive nature of this technology was not lost on policymakers, and it spurred the creation of new governance structures to manage it after the war. All of those structures become relevant to the story of how our nuclear legacies unfold in St. Louis. So paralleling scientific developments, 
We have in 1946 passage of the Atomic Energy Act of 1946, which creates something called the Atomic Energy Commission and the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, which created a direct point of entry for the commissioners to influence legislation and for the defense needs and research needs of the country to be answered legislatively. About 10 years later in 1954, that act was revised and the Atomic Energy Act of 1954 loosened some of the very strict security regulations that were put in place around nuclear technology in 1946. It allowed some private ownership of reactors, some private ownership of nuclear materials so that the president's plan for commercial nuclear energy under the umbrella of atoms for peace could be explored. So a lot of the early decision-making around nuclear technology nationally was in the hands of the Atomic Energy Commission, which came into being because of these laws. The Atomic Energy Commission, um, it turned out, was very much a creature of mid-century, mid-20th century. In 1974, the Energy Reorganization Act dissolved the Atomic Energy Commission and divided its many mandates into pieces. Um, it was decided that this agency, uh, very large and sprawling, uh, perhaps had too much under its singular umbrella. So the Energy Research and Development Administration was given control after 1974 of the nation's nuclear arsenal. That authority shifted uh, in 1977 to the current Department of Energy. And then the civilian arm of what we do nationally with nuclear technology reactor research that was placed under the purview of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in 1977. So looking at the development of nuclear technology, how it proceeded, how demand for St. Louis material um, expanded through the years of mid-century, the testing and weapons development program helped to drive that demand. So we have an infrastructural growth of US nuclear production across multiple cities, across pieces of our government. And then we have the addition of a very vigorous testing program. So the planning of tests um, initially um, was discussed as an item of importance in weapons development and how those tests should be situated. The State Department was leery of testing weapons internationally, but the Atomic Energy Commission favored a site that was distant from population centers um, that would pride the agency with the ability to stage larger tests. And so this witnesses the inception of the Pacific Proving Ground. So we have in um, the 1947-48 uh, span of time, the choice of the Eniwetok Atoll um, as the major prong of the Pacific Proving Ground joining the Bikini Atoll, which witnessed some of our first sites in the Pacific, our tests in the Pacific starting in 1946. So from December 1947 on, the Atomic Energy Commission announced that hazards would exist in this section of the Pacific Ocean, and Eniwetok was used for 43 atmospheric tests between 1948 and 58. Bikini was used for 23 tests between 1946 and 1958. Um, this resulted in some of the Pacific Islanders having to move during these years. So residents of Eniwetok moved south to this atoll of Ujilang. Residents of Bikini moved to the smaller Ronjerik Atoll here to the east. The Atomic Energy Commission, especially after the start of the Korean War, remained interested in a domestic testing site. And so the site uh, search uh, looked nationally for places that, again, would provide some distance from major population centers, ability to control uh, circumstances surrounding the tests, and attention focused on the Las, Las Vegas bombing and gunnery range, which offered 5,000 square miles, roughly, of, of empty space. And so the site was formally established in 1951. 65 miles northwest of Las Vegas, and the first field tests were conducted there in February of 1951. So there is the Nevada test site, our domestic test site. Um, overall, um, the United States conducted 1054 nuclear tests, uh, roughly 24 held jointly with the United Kingdom, 100 tests to explore the effects of nuclear weapons, others held for other purposes, 928 tests were held at the Nevada test site during its period of operation. And then in addition to these sites, the Pacific Proving Ground and Nevada test site, um, there were a few other places that also witnessed some testing. So 
What this does, in addition to, again, expansion of infrastructure and expansion of theory, is allow increase in yield in weapons. So the tests and the development program create more demand for purified uranium after the war. So World War II, again, doesn't end demand for material coming out of the Midwest for purified uranium. It only expands it. So during World War II, most of the weapons that were produced, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki weapons, were in the kiloton range. And this is an example of a kiloton weapon of the Nagasaki type imposed over New York City. So typically, when we see the schematic of a nuclear explosion or a photograph like this, the neck that rises in the mushroom cloud is about equivalent to the width of the original fireball. So this fireball, um, again, this was from a test in Bikini of 1946 of a weapon similar in yield to the Nagasaki bomb, which was about 21 kilotons. This is about 800 yards across, and then the mushroom cloud would rise from that fireball. And this bomb was anticipated by planners to have inflicted an enormous amount of destruction on New York City were it to be deployed there. By the late 1940s, the United States began earnestly investigating um, thermonuclear weapons. So yields that could be achieved perhaps not in the kilotons, but the megatons or in millions of tons of TNT. So weapons of this type derive their energy, not just from fission, the splitting of atoms, but also from fusion, the joining of hydrogen atoms that's triggered in part by a fission eruption. So the same reaction that powers the sun. In November of 1952, the United States tested its first hydrogen device at any we talk in the Pacific Proving Grounds. Um, it was not a bomb. It was a very cumbersome uh, device bigger than multiple refrigerators with wires all over it. But it was situated on the island of Ujalab, and you can see Ujalab here. And then after the test, you can see Ujalab is gone. So the hydrogen bomb test not only was successful in proving the concept, it absolutely destroyed the island upon which it was detonated. Planners used this data and subsequent data and subsequent design efforts to try to understand what would happen if a similar explosion were superimposed over major population centers like New York City. And here we see uh, the Mike detonation, which created the crater that you just witnessed, was in the Ivy series test, again, to prove this hydrogen bomb concept. The initial fireball in the hydrogen detonation is not 800 miles across, it's 800 yards rather, it's three miles across. So you can see here, the, the width of that fireball is even larger than the first one we just saw. And then the mushroom cloud rises from that fireball. So this blast would have immediately obliterated all five New York boroughs. And on March the 1st, 1954, the Atomic Energy Commission tested the first deliverable H-bomb. And this was known again as the Castle Series. So this in institutes a new era in atomic testing, a new era in feelings of atomic jeopardy. Um, all of these developments start driving public attention toward fallout ultimately, but also this, the extent to which the United States faces nuclear peril uh, from a nuclear arms race. So the fallout going enormously high in the atmosphere um, creates cultural ramifications. And some of these we see in film. So it's not an accident that some, some of the most prominent cultural representations of atomic harm and harms caused by radiation emerge in the latter part of the 50s. The song Shaboom in 1954 represents a reaction to the hydrogen bomb being detonated. This is a poster from the film Them, which came out in 1954. It featured giant atomically created ants. 1956 witnessed the release of Godzilla. Uh, 1956 also witnessed the release of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Again, this whole notion of invisible forces transforming the very fabric of, of what we are. And then this was released at the beginning of the decade in 1951, the day the earth stood still, but its message became more and more relevant through the decade. Um, how might um, atomic technology um, pose such a hazard of violence on the earth that intergalactic forces feel compelled to intervene before that violence spills over 
into uh, the societies and civilizations of other extraterrestrial beings. And one of the stars of that film was Gort, an interplanetary being whose sole purpose is to preserve peace. So the progression from cultural representations, um, nuclear to thermonuclear weapons, um, design, testing, and production, um, all of this um, served to create an atmosphere of risk. And in this atmosphere, um, the amount of production that was coming out of the Midwest of purified uranium um, only continued to expand and increase. And what we have is then another question that sits before us as we turn our attention to our local legacies. Um, why is fallout or these various facets of um, what might be left behind by nuclear production hazardous? So why is radiation and radioactive contamination a problem? So radiation can be found in more than one form depending on elements under consideration, bursts of energy in varying wavelengths and intensities. It can be streams of particles. It can be individual neutrons. It can be individual electrons. It can be what's known as alpha particles or alpha rays. These are strongly associated with uranium and daughter products. Essentially, they are helium nuclei, alpha particles, each one a clump of two protons and neutrons together. And alpha can generally be stopped by a piece of paper, but when it's internalized, then it becomes tremendously biologically damaging. So when we look at what that can look like, this is an image that was produced by the Department of Energy. And this is plutonium, which is an alpha emitter that's wedged in the lung tissue of an ape. And you can see that little star and that represents and captures the alpha tracks, the alpha particles. Again, each one clump of two neutrons and two protons shooting out in all directions from the plutonium. And it's interacting with the lung tissue and you can see the tracks that it's leaving behind uh, when you look under close resolution. Um, suspended as dust in the air, settled on surfaces, uh, radioactive elements emit these streams of particles or, or energies spontaneously. It's part of their nature and repeated impact with tissue can cause damage, tissue death, or malignancy. Um, this is an example of radium, which has the biological propensity to be treated by bodies as calcium. And the dark areas represent uh, deposits where the bone has actually incorporated the radium into the bone structure. And when this bone was placed on a photographic plate, uh, the photographic plate uh, exposed those energies coming from the element. So this is a, a fragment of bone that takes its own picture when you lay it on a photographic plate. So that's a little bit of the biological mechanism that we might be talking about with some, some radioactive substances. And now it's appropriate to turn our attention to the legacies that confront us now. Where are they and how do they evolve to be what they are? And where do we stand with cleanup? So the first place where we can find damage is in downtown St. Louis. And you can see that situated here. And that was the site of Mallinckrodt's first processing. And again, feeding through so many of those other steps in the nuclear production process. Down, downtown Mallinckrodt's former chemical works facility has been a site of cleanup for a number of years. And this site and its, its fate dovetail very closely with some of the sites in North County that we'll talk about in just a minute. And so collectively, the entity that's taking charge over those is the US Army Corps of Engineers. And this is their address. They have a website that's devoted to each of those um, enterprises and a little bit more. So you can go to the website and you can get um, updates there about the state of the cleanup, recent developments. You can see there are reports about Jana School, other questions that the public has had, and then links to important reports, um, some of which we'll talk about here in just a couple of minutes. So other sites of legacy contamination that relate very thoroughly to Mallinckrodt's production can be found in North County. And you can see some of the very important ones here outlined in, in red. So the government, the Atomic Energy Commission, acquired about 22 acres just to the north of Lambert Airport in 1946. You can see that site right here. You can see its orientation to our runways, our airport runways locally. And they began accumulating the wastes from uranium processing within the boundaries of this site. 
And so if we look here, this is from the record of decision concerning the cleanup of the North County sites. You can see that area closely demarcated. Um, piles of slag-like residue collected here through a period of years to heights of about 40 feet over the 22 acres. There were at least 50,000 ore barrels, miscellaneous scrap, and piles of debris. Um, the piles contain traces of radium, thorium, and uranium, and they were completely open to the elements, to wind, and to rain. These red lines were initially uh, deemed to be areas uh, that were contaminated by this phase of storage and processing. Um, the 2005 record of decision um, anticipated that at least 80 properties fell within this um, adjacent area of impacts. We now know that there are many more than 80 properties that are affected. Um, contamination was understood to, again, have expressed, to spread widely within this boundary. And it turns out there is additional contamination that we'll, we'll come to here in a few minutes. But it isn't just environmental forces like wind and rain and the action of creeks and water that spread the material, it was also human action. So in 1966, the material that was stored in this oddly shaped island here with the, the points on one end and then the straight end here um, was purchased. The residues were purchased by a company called Continental Mining and Milling, and they drove the ore and open dump trucks just to the north a few blocks to 9200 Laddie Avenue to a new ore storage area. Again, it's about six blocks away. And this other hashed area represents this secondary area of processing. About 100,000 tons of material, it's estimated, was probably moved. And Continental Mining and Milling uh, went bankrupt in the course of this effort. And the property changed hands twice more until it ended up in the hands of Cotter Corporation. And Cotter Corporation did some processing. And then in 1973, they moved the remainder of the material to a landfill uh, called Westlake Landfill in North St. Louis County. And this is a schematic uh, that shows um, the amount of material, um, at least initially, that was anticipated that was probably moved. So this is a map of where Westlake sits in relation to some of our, our major highways. The EPA estimates that Cotter shipped um, roughly 40,000 tons of waste commingled with garbage and debris at the site to become even more voluminous when we think about um, quantities of contamination because it was used as fill at the landfill site, mixed with trash, some buried, some near the surface. Um, ultimately, Westlake sits in a highly popular area, populated area near Earth City. Uh, it's a commercial area with factories and offices not too far from the former Mills Mall and a residential area of Bridgeton, and it's also 1.5 miles east of the Missouri River. So in totality, the Westlake landfill encompasses about 200 acres, and it's divided into distinct areas. So the EPA calls these areas operable units. So OU1, which you see on this area here in, in gold on this map, OU1 encompasses all of the gold areas, and it's divided itself into radiological areas. Radiological area one that you see on the map encompasses about eight acres, 58,700 cubic yards of material with rim possibly as deep as 85 to 89 feet. Radiological area two, 27 acres, about 251,000 cubic yards of material, rim possibly as deep as 43 feet. Um, both of these areas one and two are pre-1974 landfills. And then there is, if you look off to the top corner, uh, two other pieces that are considered part of the original OU1, a buffer zone, which is a triangular portion of ground, and then lot 2A2, which is being used by a local business um, for parking and various purposes. So around that, you see the area in gray. And so originally, this was labeled um, operable unit two, as opposed to operable unit one. And operable unit two was considered, they're shown in light yellow, um, to be largely uncontaminated in 2018. And if you look at the various pieces of it in, in a bit higher resolution, you can see that these also represent uh, various landfill uses. So just between um, area one and area two of OU1, there's a closed demolition landfill. And then just a little bit further to the west, there's an inactive sanitary landfill predating 1974. And then if you look to the southern third of the site, um, you see this um, lazy hourglass uh, pair of two quarries, and that's the Bridgeton landfill, which closed in 2004. 
and it comprises um, the South Quarry and the North Quarry and the subsurface smoldering event um, that is underway in the South Quarry has been remarked um, in many news broadcasts, um, discovered probably around 2010, continues to smolder. So in 2008, the record of decision determining the steps to clean up Westlake landfill, um, the supposedly um, non-radioactive OU2 was signed, and that gave control of the Bridgeton landfill in this area in yellow uh, to the Missouri Department of Natural Resources, and that received a separate cleanup plan than OU1. And there was an original record of decision for OU1, the radiologically contaminated areas that was signed in 2008, that plan to cap the waste in place, but this was disputed by the community, and so that has been revisited and there's now a second record of decision in place. And EPA is gonna be uh, the, the main supervisor of that cleanup. So the second amended record of decision for Westlake that was put together after the community objected, objected to the first one, um, took 10 years of study to put together. Um, what does it call for? So excavation of rim in areas one and two. So in those blue areas on the map in front of us, um, a shell is eight feet and as deep as 20 feet excavation of the buffer zone and the little lot there at the top of the plot of ground, installing a cover sufficient to meet legal standards for containment of hazardous waste and radon gas, and water management. So this has taken various forms. There is a new operable unit for Westlake that was just recently created, operable unit three, that's involving extensive study of groundwater. Um, in 2015, which is a bit ago now, Republic Services constructed a leachate treatment facility with a capacity to treat 300,000 gallons of leachate um, a day, 2.1 million gallons of leachate a week. And so um, the South Quarry here, where that smoldering event is burning, has generated a lot of liquid, a lot of effluent, and Republic Services is trying to treat that water, um, even as the EPA is looking at the bigger picture of what groundwater under the site is doing. So um, there have been a number of questions about this site, about its health effects, um, about the potential of the fire to spread. So EPA regards the potential of the fire to spread to other areas of the site as somewhat low, but they continue to watch that. Ultimately, the site has been uh, the effect, the has been the focus of a number of studies in terms of trying to gauge. Um, whether material has moved off site and to what extent. And this has also been a focal point of public concern. So in 2015, the Missouri Attorney General sponsored a group of studies that seemed to show off site contamination in some trees and vegetation. Um, the 2018 record of decision talks about all of the remedies as geared toward lessening future harm, sort of with that idea in mind. And current study of the site and design of the remedy is also looking at that question of off-site movement. So there'll be more developments um, in that direction, especially as pertains to what the groundwater is doing through time. So there was a health study about this site that was completed in 2018. And the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services um, wanted to update the community on possible hazards to date that Westlake might have posed. So this is a second prong of, a, of focus um, in addition to what the cleanup details actually entail. And so that report said that past sulfur compounds generated by the landfill may have harmed the health of people by aggravating chronic respiratory disease, causing difficulty breathing, headache, nausea, and fatigue. And in the past, exposures may have harmed the health and quality of life of nearby residents by causing stress, impairing mood, and increasing the risk of respiratory infections. So this continues to be addressed uh, by public health interventions of various kinds and a lot of, of public scrutiny. So for those of you who are interested in reading more about Westlake, there are some important sources where you can go to find information. One of those is the Westlake Landfill EPA dashboard, and you can access that at this web address. And so the Westlake Landfill dashboard shows um, the most up-to-date testing information concerning the site. You can also consult the CAG website for Westlake, which is the community advisory group um, where citizens share information and EPA shares information with citizens. And one of the things that you'll notice right away, if you look at the dashboard in its current form, is that all of these areas in blue, these deep blue borings, are tests 
um, more recent tests that have been undertaken by EPA that demonstrate a much more um, expansive footprint of waste than had originally been planned for at the site. So what we see after this record of decision that I've just been describing was signed, this decision about what to do about the contamination, where the contamination is situated. Recent testing has shown that it is more scattered and more diffuse throughout the site than original estimates suggested. So the division into operable unit one and operable unit two, one of which is contaminated and one of which is not, this has been vastly um, complicated by this recent testing. And so this is very much a live story that um, will continue to evolve. And so these new discoveries, again, where you see royal blue in the, in the borings, those will inform decisions about cleanup and the ultimate design of how waste will be excavated going forward. So unfortunately, Westlake is not our only contaminated site. And we also have other areas of North County, again, growing out of the experience of the storage area that we were just discussing a few minutes ago in another direction. And so here's our image again of the airport site. And so again, we have 100,000 tons of miscellaneous byproducts sitting right alongside Coldwater Creek from 1946 to 1966. And then when those materials were moved to that site on Laddie Avenue here further to the north, they sat again exposed to wind and to rain as they were carried. Again, they were spilled along the way along these streets. And what you see here running adjacent to the storage sites is Coldwater Creek. And so as you look further to the north, you can see how Coldwater Creek runs extensively through North St. Louis neighborhoods, North St. Louis County. And then this inset map shows you that area of detail in relation to other waterways. So since 1988, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has been the federal agency of record responsible for cleanup of Coldwater Creek. The Corps has estimated that their efforts will conclude in the 2030s as they attempt to pull um, radioactive byproducts that might have seeped into the creek bed and adjacent areas out of the environment. So just like with Westlake, the area around Coldwater Creek in North County have been subject to attention, not just in terms of how to remedy environmental impacts, but also the potential health impacts that are posed by the sites. So a late 1980s study by the Missouri Department of Health revealed a potentially high incidence of cancer along Nyflot Avenue near the Laddie processing area. In 2013, the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services reviewed cancer incidents from 1996 to 2004 in six zip codes that sit adjacent to Coldwater Creek, and they found statistically significant elevations of female breast, colon, prostate, kidney, and some other cancers. So in September of 2014, the agency expanded this earlier survey to include years from 2007 to 2011, and they added some more zip codes to see what they would find. And they found, again, statistically significant uh, potentially elevated risks of cancer, childhood brain and nervous system cancers, leukemia, breast, colon, prostate, kidney, and bladder cancers as compared with the rest of Missouri. Now, these studies that Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services um, helped to spearhead informed later federal work on this same question. And so in early 2015, based on these findings, the state began collaborating with federal officials on an even more extensive study and three years later, the Federal Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, it's short, shortened as ATSDR, produced a draft response that was finalized in 2019. This is the cover of that report. So it's available online. Um, it's available for you to read if you'd like to read it. Um, as this report was being compiled as an interim measure in 2016, um, the ATSDR released a list of recommendations about Coldwater Creek for people living alongside the creek or in the vicinity of it for ways that they could avoid further future risk while um, the issue was being studied. And you can see here what some of those recommendations were. Um, avoid getting in the creek. Don't allow children to play in the creek. Uh, various um, safeguards you could take if you have a yard that borders the creek um, to watch what you do as you're gardening and so forth. So it was a pretty extensive list of, of recommendations. So the 2019 report um, used 
extensive sampling gathered by the Corps of Engineers up to the St. Dennis Bridge. And you can see where the St. Dennis Bridge is here on our map. And the Corps of Engineers continues to take surveys and to study uh, the remainder of the creek up through that 2030s timeline. So what did the 2019 ATSDR report say? ATSDR's final report did find an increased risk uh, greater than one in 10,000 uh, for some cancers and groups living along the creek and it divided those groups into categories. So recreational exposures in the past, 1960s to 1990s, according to ATSDR, could have resulted in elevated risks for developing bone cancer, lung cancer, or leukemia. Residential exposures from the 1960s to the 1990s could have resulted in elevated risks for bone cancer, lung cancer, leukemia, and to a lesser extent, skin cancer. More recently, residential exposures in recent years could have resulted in elevated rates of lung cancer, recreational exposures in recent years, they felt after remediation further down the creek near the original storage sites, probably wasn't as dangerous as it might've been in the past. So again, ATSDR has recommended that former and current residents share their information about residency and exposure with physicians. They have recommended that the Corps of Engineers sample sediment um, from Coldwater Creek where it might have moved because of construction or flooding. They recommend sampling indoor dust in homes where yards have required cleanup and sampling of any debris left in basements. And they suggest um, if it's possible to put up signs around the creek to warn people about it. Um, they make other recommendations and other qualifications of recommendations about um, screening um, for health concerns, and they raise some questions about that as a way forward. Um, they're concerned about false positives. It's a, it's a very complicated medical issue. So apart from Westlake and Coldwater Creek, contamination in the metropolitan area can also be found in the permanent waste storage cell at Weldon Spring in St. Charles County. And this is where we'll conclude our, our survey this morning. So this is a map from the Department of Energy detailing where Weldon Spring is situated compared to these other sites. In the middle 1950s, as demand for purified uranium was increasing for all of the reasons that we talked about, Weldon Spring opened as the most advanced uranium processing facility in the world in 1957 and it was part of a 17,000 acre complex that had previously been used to produce TNT and DNT during World War II. And the Atomic Energy Commission was given 217 acres of this larger site. So process adjustments at Weldon meant that the waste generated here was in liquid form. So it was gathered in pits called uh, raffinate pits and it was as a liquid effluent. So the first two you can see in the image here off to the side were 1.2 acres each. In 1958, there was a third pit that was created that covered 8.4 acres, and it had a capacity of 4.5 million cubic feet to a depth of 9 to 10 feet. And then they added a fourth pit in 1964 that covered 15 acres and it had a capacity of 12 million cubic feet. Um, it was never filled to capacity, uh, but collectively these pits um, were a formidable uh, storage uh, area for effluents that contained, again, traces of radioactive elements, and those were unfortunately also open to the environment. Um, in 1958, Weldon Spring claimed a quarry just to the south of the plant. It had been created in the construction of the DNT and TNT works, and it was used as a repository for Weldon Spring plant waste. And in 60 to 63, it received construction debris from the demolition of downtown production facilities. And so here are some pictures of that so you can see here land moving equipment and various debris. And these are barrels in the bottom of the quarry at Weldon Spring. So a tremendous amount of material was dumped in the raffinate pits and in the quarries. And after being placed on standby, Weldon Spring was considered as a site of production for the manufacture of Agent Orange in, 18, or in 1967, but it was deemed too expensive because the existing uranium plants would have to be decontaminated from the former nuclear production in order for that to happen. And so we did not become a production site for Agent Orange. From 1970 to 85, this site remained in federal custody, but then it was transferred back to DOE specifically for cleanup. And the major facets of that cleanup were carried out from 1988 to 2001. 
So what did that cleanup look like very briefly? So in the two years from 1993 to 1995, 120,000 cubic yards of debris and trash were removed from the quarry and 70 million gallons of contaminated water had been treated there by the year 2000. At the raffinate pits, sludge was collected and mixed with an ash cement to form 186,000 cubic yards of grout and that grout was placed in the containment cell that you see. The permanent disposal cell is designed to connect with trails and be a park. It's the most distinctive feature of the cleanup. So within the cell, which is the highest point in St. Charles County, there are in upwards of one and a half million cubic yards of chemically and radiologically contaminated material that are sealed inside. Um, and the idea is to keep that separation from the community for at least a thousand years. That's what the original design called for. Um, the site continues to be defined by permanent controls and monitoring. And there is an interpretive center and museum at the site if you'd like to go and visit it. At the top of the cell, as you can see here, there are monuments to um, the towns that were torn down to make way for the DNT and TNT works. Um, each town has its monument, and then there's one that describes the purpose of the cell and its relation to other communities. This is an older image from 2006, but they've just very recently completed a permanent museum where they'll give you tours and you can hear about not only how the site is constructed, how the cell is constructed, there's a permanent um, exhibit there that's devoted to our nuclear workers and our cleanup workers who worked on the site, and they can explain various process elements and what those look like in St. Charles County. So it's, it's an amazing view from the top of the cell. And again, it is the highest point in St. Charles County. And so the last piece of our legacy here locally that um, is, is very noteworthy this morning is the experience of our nuclear workers. So our nuclear workers from the Mallinckrodt Chemical Works were the first workers in the nation to process purified uranium on an industrial scale. And many of them were exposed to radiation during this processing. And many of them suffered harm to their health as a result. So in the year 2000, Congress passed a piece of legislation called the Energy Employees Occupational Illness Compensation Program Act. And that act was designed to compensate nuclear workers nationally for their pain and suffering and for their contributions to the nation. And our workers were the first to successfully petition under the terms of that act for the creation of a special exposure cohort. And that special exposure cohort allows workers to be compensated as a group rather than have to apply individually for benefits. And since then, many other workers have followed in the footsteps of our own workers and applied for and received their own inclusion in separate special exposure cohorts of their own. And that has achieved collectively roughly $23 billion in benefits paid out over time by the federal government. And so what we have here is a sprawling example of a network of infrastructure, our region's place in that infrastructure and all of the questions that go with it um, for long-term health, for the implications of citizenship and democracy, how do people participate in the political process? How does our political process respond to the needs of our communities? And I think we're still watching that unfold right now as we speak. And so um, this concludes what I had brought to present and share. And um, I'm happy to try to answer questions. If anybody has any questions, be delighted to chat further. Okay, thank you, Dr. Verhoff. We'll start Thanks. off with a question that someone had put in the chat. Um, and if you have questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand um, and then we'll, I'll call on you. Um, so the first question was about the cleanup, um, particularly when you were talking about the Westlake landfill. Um, so when the material is, is it removed? Um, what do they do with contaminated material? So right now, they are in the investigative phase of that remedial design. And so at Westlake in particular, um, the remedy, um, I believe, calls for the removal of waste offsite, uh, very similar to what's happening in North County. So when we look at North County and Coldwater Creek, we have firmer, more concrete examples of what that's going to look like. So with the sites around Coldwater Creek, there have been about a million cubic yards of contaminated materials pulled from the creek bed, um, pulled from that area immediately within and adjacent to what they call the St. Louis Airport storage area. Um, those are put in trains, shipped west, 
to uh, waste disposal facilities that are distant from population centers. And that um, I believe is the intended direction that um, events at Westlake are going to take according to the remedy that's been selected. But we're studying right now how that's going to happen. And so we're not quite to the point of removal yet at Westlake. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and another question was, um, the question is, what is radon? Um, what does mitigation of radon do? Okay, so radon is a daughter product. So when we look at um, the chain of radioactive decay, um, radioactive elements like uranium are inherently unstable. They have large cumbersome nuclei and they break down on their own spontaneously. And so uranium um, gives rise to daughter products, which give rise to other daughter products. And radon is one of those daughter products. And so it's a gas, which is itself in the process of breaking down into something else. And so one of the problems with radon is it's radon for a little while, and then some of its other daughter products are a little bit more solid than that. And so if you inhale radon gas, those daughters continue to emerge and they can emerge in contact with um, organs and, and human tissue. And so radon gas can accumulate naturally in the environment because it comes from stores of uranium and, and rock deep in the ground. And so it can seep into basements and you can have your basement inspected. They have kits where you can do a radon test in a basement and they put a fan and an exhaust works and you can, you can take that gas out so that you're not exposed to it in your home. And when you look at cleanup sites, like the ones that we have um, at SLAPS at North County by Coldwater Creek, um, that is something that um, is of concern there too. So the cap, for example, that's being devised for the Westlake landfill has as one of its functions um, functioning as a radon barrier. So that's definitely something that's looked at. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Lot, you had your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question on that uh, bomb that went off in, uh, in the desert. By, uh, the desert there. It do they have a fence around it? Is, it, is that a dangerous uh, area to be walking or sightseeing? That's an interesting question. And so there's a multi-part answer. So that area is actually not generally open to the public. I believe they open the uh, Trinity site once a year. And um, you can look that up on, on their website. It's a, it's a park service managed area. So the park service has a whole site devoted to discussing Trinity, and, and nuclear history. And they give, I believe one day a year <laughs> access to it and, you, and they have a, a ceremonial facet of that. And um, after nuclear detonations, that process of decay, of radioactive decay proceeds apace. So we're now uh, 50 years out from the, well, more than 50 years out actually from the initial uh, Trinity test. And so that landscape has changed a lot. And I wouldn't want to speak to what the particular burden of the, the various radioactive elements is by now, but I think that that's probably available um, if you if you look on the Park Service site or if you direct that to their their rangers there. Yeah. That bomb in Hiroshima, uh, I understand they built a city on top of that area where the bomb blew up. Is that true? Or what, how would they do about that area? Well, they sent in investigators from the American government in the aftermath of the Hiroshima detonation to study radioactive effects. So there was an impact from fallout. They did find radiation induced illnesses. They also rebuilt the city. They, they rebuilt Hiroshima and they rebuilt Nagasaki. And that was in the shadow of these former areas of detonation. And I think that the former nuclear bomb survivors, the, the survivors of the original blasts have been studied extensively through time as a, as a population that was exposed to a known exposure. And um, urban life has continued there. Have there been health effects? I think, yes. I think those have been under study for a number of decades, but they have rebuilt in the shadow of, of the blasts. And so, and again, we're right in the anniversary window. We're right between the, the two the two anniversaries today. Thank you a lot. Um, Ernie, you had your hand up and then we'll have uh, one or two questions in the chat. Yeah, uh, being in the property value uh, profession, my question revolves around the property values around these sites. Uh, the homeowners have been in an uproar 
due to the uh, contamination and the industrial uh, values around these areas. Uh, what studies have been done uh, revolving around this and the ongoing effect of the property values on the ongoing nature as the radiation continues? This is, this is a very important point. And I know it's important to the Corps of Engineers. I've heard a few of the engineers speak very sensitively on this point that um, they try to test thoroughly and also do that without you know, creating undue alarm um, to be specific um, and to be as sensitive as possible with the understanding that people's properties and their lives, these are some of the most important things that, that we can talk about. So as far as how all of these developments will affect property values through time. Unfortunately, I'm afraid I don't have a specific answer to that question. I think it's very much an open and evolving question My and it's something that will keep receiving attention, I'm sure, through time. I have heard um, engineers speak very specifically to that concern. Um, and again, wanting to be effective without unduly injurious to those who, who might be affected. So I, Again, I, I'm not sure there is a comprehensive specific answer that I can give, but it, it's certainly a question. Okay, um, so I'll read one question from the chat and then we'll go to you, Steve. Um, so someone asked, when we were children in the 1950s and 60s, we live in St. Louis and someone was collecting children's teeth to determine radiation exposure. Was that related to this project? That's actually a separate project. So one of the things that happened, um, in some ways it's separate and in some ways it overlaps very thoroughly with the story that we're talking about. So when we see the development of hydrogen bombs in the early 1950s, what that led to was a massive increase in the amount of global fallout that was spreading across the world. And those fallout maps that were put together by the Atomic Energy Commission and shared with the public showed a very substantial deposition of H-bomb fallout down the Mississippi River Valley. And St. Louis was squarely in the middle of that. And there was concern that there was going to be a health impact on local children. And so the group that spearheaded the collection of the baby teeth was called the Citizens Committee for Nuclear Information. And that was a collaboration between members of the public and academics locally, collaborating with academics elsewhere. And they collected the teeth and they looked for depositions of strontium-90 in the teeth and to try to determine what that might mean as far as gauging fallout, known fallout in the air versus what was being registered biologically in America's children and specifically children here in the Midwest and in St. Louis. So um, we have, in some respects, a, a dubious distinction in St. Louis of being present both at one of the epicenters of the fallout crisis. We were instrumental in playing a role in the manufacture of, of nuclear weapons, and we have both of those things happening at the same time. Um, eventually, by the late 1950s, early 1960s, and especially on the heels of the Cuban Missile Crisis, public alarm over fallout and over the implications of hydrogen weapons leads to the limited test ban treaty that was signed in 1963, and that ended above ground nuclear testing in the open uh, that had dominated many years in the 1950s. And so um, the baby tooth study contributed to that. And so it was very important both in our local experience and it turns out in the, the international history of proliferation and, and testing of these weapons. So it's a really important moment. Thank you. Uh, Steve, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, several years ago, uh, my wife and I visited McKelvey School for the American Cancer Society. I was doing a relay for life at that time. And there was a young boy there that had cancer and we were trying to form a team. And while I was there, um, one of the teachers were telling me that there was a very high number of teachers and children uh, there that had, for some reason, come down with cancer. And they, and they thought it was due to the landfill that wasn't too far away from the school. and. It seems that we have created an environmental nightmare here. And do we have any estimate of how many cancers just in this area have been created by all of this uranium that we have put into the, these landfills and all, and, and all the workers that worked on this? And, and just recently, the first time in 30 years, we've just opened up a nuclear plant for uh, electricity. 
but what is the future of uh, nuclear, uh, creating electricity by nuclear plants? And, and, and is there any way to do this safely? Uh, I mean, it, it seems like we have just, we're killing ourselves. And, it, and I don't know if the government even knows what to do about this. Those are all really good questions. And I hope as a historian that what we're seeing is the beginning of a moment of um, intense scrutiny and a building of our epidemiological efforts to surveil and to, to take stock, just like you've suggested of what is our potential scope of damage, what kinds of policy answers can be brought to bear to address that. Um, there are multiple pieces of the, the federal government looking at this question, and I hope that that bears fruit in the direction that, that you're describing, that we can bring our picture more into focus. Um, how many illnesses do we have? Um, right now, some of the, um, the steps in that direction have been spurred from the community. So there are... The, yeah, the, the, the public health study that I mentioned from the ATSDR is an important first step surrounding Coldwater Creek. Um, there are uh, Facebook groups, like there's one called Coldwater Creek, just the facts, please, where they did an informal health study of their own. And they had um, hundreds and then probably thousands of folks sending in um, health information and they made a map and they pinpointed where cases can be located. And you can see that map if you go on the Coldwater Creek Facebook page. As far as um, nuclear power and nuclear power technologies, um, the, the industrial side of how to make nuclear fuel um, is it's still very industrially heavy. And typically when we see pictures of nuclear power plants, you see the white plant and you see the, the steam and that's all true, right? But right before that, you have to make the fuel. And so fuel fabrication um, continues to be extremely intensive and require industry. And whether it's safe, um, whether it's, it's, it's the good policy choice, that I think will ultimately rest with the voters and with the people who make our public policies. And so more information about what's involved with these various steps, mining our fuel, producing our fuel, and then bringing us to that power plant phase where we're actually running a reactor. Um, the more people understand about that, the more they look at it, the better. Does the McKelvey School, was that near the uh, Westlake landfill? Do you do you know that or not? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm afraid I don't. I couldn't, I couldn't Park say Lake. exactly. And, and, yeah, yeah. It's, um, like a mile, two miles, I think. That's where I went to elementary school. So yeah, it's pretty close. Pretty close, two miles. It's, so. it's very difficult when you have a, a case of illness to pinpoint it to a specific cause. And that's another thing that makes specific cases and trying to pinpoint causation difficult because you can't necessarily trace back with certainty, with exact certainty, whether a particular illness comes from a particular cause. Where I so. But uh, we can study it. Uh, John, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, what is... Am I unmuted? Yeah. Uh, uh, I recognize there's a various uh, elements uh, besides uranium, uh, but uh, in general, can we figure out what's the half-life of all these uh, byproducts and the radioactive by or, you know, is a thousand years within reason or is it some of them uh, very short-lived? Some people are building houses uh, you know, like oh, at Hiroshima, and uh, you know, there's still radioactivity there. Well, on the upside, we do know what the half lives are, so we understand how a lot of our radioactive elements behave. And a physicist could talk about that. Um, I'm afraid probably better than I can, but I do know, like, if you take uranium as an example, as a point of entry, since it was our product here, and it's one of the the elements most under study here, um, we have. Um, major elements of concern, radium, thorium, um, and uranium. Uranium has a half-life of 4.5 billion years, natural uranium. So it's actually very long-lived. And that's one of the reasons you can get radon gas welling up from rock in the ground. It's, it's primordial. It's primordial, the stocks of this in the Earth's crust in certain places. And it just, the radon gets created from that. And um, depending on what element you're looking at, that half-life will be different. Um, plutonium has a different half-life. Thorium has a different half-life. Radium has a different half-life. And then to make it even more complicated, the different isotopes of the various elements, like we were talking about earlier, those can have different half-lives too. And so um, energy level varies with half-life. 
And some of the, the half-life um, of the various uh, fission products coming out of a nuclear detonation is extremely short because they're very, very energetic. And so some of them disappear quickly. Um, some of them are longer lived. And so when you're thinking about what does a detonation of a, a nuclear device in any particular place mean, like in Hiroshima or Nagasaki, you would wanna look at those local conditions and the person who'd be best able to speak to those would be an expert uh, from, from those places who has all of that data and then can encapsulate it for you to say, well, this is what we see. This is what remains. This is what dissipated early on. Um, so those are difficult questions. So in, in summary, we are creating either in, our, in uh, Nevada or wherever they're burying these train loads full of debris and the, the uh, spent fuel rods from uh, nuclear reactors and uh, power plants. Uh, th that, that is a problem that uh, will live on Earth for potentially uh, millions and billions of years in making uh, those areas where it's stored uninhabitable. It means that, yes, wherever that is stored, that will require perpetual surveillance, perpetual stewardship. So Weldon Spring, the cell there is designed to last for a thousand years, but it will need stewardship past that point. The radioactive fuel, um, when we find it, we don't right now have a, a comprehensive storage solution for our radioactive reactor fuel. So it's stored at multiple sites across the nation and that's under scrutiny, what will be our national way forward. Um, hopefully we'll find a, a comprehensive policy, but wherever that fuel is, will require perpetual attention. Yes, and our, our low-level waste sites will also require perpetual stewardship, um, mixed waste sites the same. Um, just like the landfill, Westlake landfill and other landfills, they have um, institutional controls on them. So once a site is used for that purpose, for radioactive waste disposal purposes, it has to be watched and monitored. And uh, well, uh, is that way. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead, Lot. Yeah, I, I tell you, uh, it's not safe to have nuclear of anything because uh, idiots like in Ukraine with that nuclear plant is always in danger of having problems all over the world. So no matter if it's here or anywhere, you always have problems with nuclear props, with nuclear uh, like electricity and whatever we have around us. It's, it's certainly a, a point of view on the, on the policy because it, it it's very hazardous what's happening there. Uh, apparently, a, accounts coming out of that region have suggested that the plant has been mined. Um, there's nuclear fuel stored there. So um, we also have nuclear fuel stored at various sites around the United States. Um, what will be the ultimate fate of the fuel? Where will it go? Um, these are These are very important policy questions, and they haven't been answered yet. They haven't been answered yet, but you know, they're under discussion and it's voters and citizens who can weigh in and maybe help steer some of that, hopefully. But I, I hope for the best. I join you in your concern about that plant. I hope that uh, the, the world can come together to manage some kind of a, an umbrella of protection around that so it doesn't devolve into some kind of a disaster there. Is well, that we pressure? Have fools around this world. We're not, no one is really safe. Okay, thank you a lot. Um, so we'll get one quick question and then we'll uh, give the last question to Harvey after that. Uh, so like with all the studies that have been done, is it the opponent to getting all this information historically leading up to like finally getting those studies done been indifference? Is there been special interests that have prevented, you know, getting this information about the effects of the landfill or Cold Water Creek and so on? That's, that's a difficult question. Um, I think Attention to this topic, public attention, makes a very, very big difference. And public attention to the topic has waxed and waned through years in our local region, and I think nationally as well. I think there have been studies that have been done about nuclear weapons to show a waxing and waning in public interest and attention to the potential for global nuclear war. When we look at our own sites, there have been moments of intense scrutiny and attention. And I think we're in one of those now. And I think that really helps propel scrutiny by agencies of what is happening 
with particular sites. So if you look at some of the reports that I mentioned, they came out, some of them around the same time, the attention to Coldwater Creek that was generated by the Coldwater Creek Facebook page and that map of health effects, the films collectively taken together, um, the revisiting of the Westlake record of decision, all of that has really focused public attention in a way that I think is compelling public officials to act. Um, is there a concerted campaign of resistance um, to knowing what's happening? I'm not sure I would say that. I'm not sure I would say that, but I do see um, a very um, healthy potential for our knowledge to compound because of the attention that's growing. And I hope that we keep on in that direction. I think there's a lot of people who've brought their credentials and their integrity to this situation. And they don't um, they don't all use the same tools or speak the same disciplinary languages, like the ATSDR folks, you know, they're in different disciplines than our Corps of Engineer folks. And then we have some others working on this, but I think they're all bringing their best. And when we put all of that together, I hope it brings us to a good result. Um, that is my hope as a historian. I think this is one of the uh, most intense moments of scrutiny of these sites that I have seen. And I've been following this my entire life since I was a little girl, and they've been cleaning up the sites for pretty much the entirety of my life. Um, they started surveying our sites to figure out where contaminants might have spread in the 70s and, and really even, even before that. So more information, not less is better. And um, I think that most of I, I think the professionals who are working on this, the Army Corps professionals, the epidemiologists, I think that there is sincere interest in getting at real answers. That's what I see. I, I think that hopefully the academic side of this is going to bear fruit in that way. And I hope, I know that question earlier, you know, how many people, how many people are affected? I hope that as we go, this work can bring that into focus. And I think we're on our way to some kind of an answer. I hope that we get there eventually. It's it's a big question, and I think it's going to take us a minute to get to the answer, but I hope we do. Okay, thank you. And Harvey, uh, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, uh, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, <clears throat> just a quick comment. I, I am working with some of the agencies um, and advising some people who are working with the agencies. There is a lot of uh, bureaucratic momentum that has to be overcome. Um, a lot of these decisions were made in the past um, by people who didn't think that there was a threat from the radiation exposure or people that didn't do extensive uh, testing and, and didn't recognize the ex extent of contamination in this area. Um, so there is, there is a lot of pushback um, and change that has to happen in these agencies, um, and we're making progress on that. I do want to mention along those lines, um, one of the things we're starting to advocate for, uh, you heard about the ATSDR study that showed increased instances of cancers. <clears throat> Legally, they only study um, diagnosis by zip code at time of diagnosis. So if you're familiar with the North County Coldwater Creek area, <clears throat> uh, that area used to be predominantly white, now it's predominantly black. Um, there's been a lot of migration and a lot of the folks who grew up there playing in the creek, literally playing in the creek, have moved out and gotten lots of bad cancers. <clears throat> so what we're trying to do is get some changes on national level so that the uh, reporting includes historic uh, residences of people who are diagnosed with various illnesses, not just here. You know, they they haven't they haven't grown up in Coldwater Creek, and now they're living in Washington, and they got cancer, so they show up on the the, the statistics for Washington. We need that to be tracked back. That hey, they grew up in Coldwater Creek, and they have one of the uh, identified cancers related to this area. <clears throat> the second thing I want to mention is Josh Holly's. <clears throat> Josh Hawley's um, uh, legislation that he got into the National Defense Authorization Act, um, the uh, uh, Compensation Act for people who were uh, affected by the fallout, uh, downwinders they're called, um, had to be renewed. 
and he saw the opportunity. He had been working on this legislation previously, and he saw the opportunity to include it with that renewal. And it is in the National Defense Authorization where that compensation comes from. Um, and he got it through uh, on a bipartisan vote, Democrats and Republicans, um, to include his amendment to include the St. Louis metropolitan area, St. Charles area, and some other areas around the country in that compensation. Uh, potentially, people could get like $50,000 uh, per person who's, you know, has one of the documented uh, illnesses or their survivors uh, and possibly medical reimbursement as well. Um, the issue is, and the reason I'm, I'm happy that you're all here today, it now has to go through the House of Representatives. And again, bipartisan, uh, Representative Cory Bush and uh, well, Congress, Congresswoman Cory Bush and Congresswoman Ann Wagner uh, and some of the other Congress people, Luke DeMeyer, others, hopefully are going to team up and work together to get this this through the uh, the House of Representatives. So that's um, you'll you'll probably see it in the news, and when you do uh, officially see stuff, please call those offices and let them know it's important to St. Louis to get that through. Um, it's time we stop creating new casualties of World War II, folks. Um, these exposures are killing people. It's all a, a, a well-meaning war effort. And uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Harvey, for the comments. Um, so I think with that, um, we'll call it to a close. I just want to say thank you very much, Wendy. That was extremely informative, very thorough, fascinating. Um, and I think this is uh never had this many people stay on this far late after a program. So I know people really loved it. Um, so thank you very much. Well, thank you. I appreciate the invitation. I'm very honored to speak with you and I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you for the invitation. All right. Take care, everyone. Hope thank everyone you. has a great day. Bye-bye.